in this state be able to be married. So we have taken away rights of people in, since 1972 instead of granted, granted them. Can, can Smiley, I come in? Yes, please. You know, I, I, in my career at different times, I have faced rather hostile audiences who uh, were convinced that the court was ending life as a judicial activist and all those <laughs> sorts of things. And uh, uh, all of the rights that people have, and they want to talk about this right and that right. Uh, and I, I listen to that, and usually what I do at the end of the tirade uh, that, uh, that I'm uh, listening to, I say, well, fine, I, great, it's your constitution. What, what one of your rights do you want us to get rid of? <laughs> and there's kind of this deer in the headlights look. And it, you know, people talk about these things in a disconnected fashion. You know, when, when a legislature or a court decision takes away somebody's, part of somebody's right of privacy, they're not just taking it away from that individual, they're taking it away from everybody. Every time our constitutional rights are diminished, everybody suffers. And, and people don't think of, think of this that way. Let me, let me mention one quickly. Can I, one constitutional right that, that nobody thinks about. Uh, it's it's kind of one of those that's buried way in the back, the second to the last right of the Constitution. It's uh, Article 2, Section 34. Probably none of you have even ever heard of it. Uh, but it says, and I quote, unenumerated rights. The enumeration of this Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny, impair, or disparage others, others, any other rights retained by the people, other unenumerated rights. So what are those unenumerated rights? Uh, Hard to say, but, and I'm going to contradict what I just told you about not going back to the transcript. <laughs> In this case, I think it's legitimate because uh, that language is, is not completely clear. What, what, are, what are we talking about? Here's what the committee said about that language. They considered that this section, which was passed unanimously, to be a crucial part of any effort to revitalize the state government's approach to civil liberties questions. Revitalize. And this section may be the source of innovative judicial activity in the civil liberties field. I think it's a very important right. And I, and I've, I've argued in several dissents and concurrences that our court ought to give uh, some legs to that, right? Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't caught on. But uh, I think it's an important right. And if the framers intended that right to be uh, a mandate, or at least uh, uh, some encouragement to our court system to revitalize people's civil rights, to, to be activists, to uh, engage in, in innovative judicial activity, to use their words, uh, that a lot of the rights that have been taken away, a lot of the rights that uh, uh, people may have in a new society and a new culture that didn't exist four years ago, that may be a wellspring of authority to do that. And Judge, it really is, because that was our thinking. We wanted to make sure there was going to be some type of constitutional safety net so the rights of people would not in any way be subjected to something less than what's guaranteed in the Constitution. Right, but, you, but you as that. a judge, though, you can't. <clears throat> I mean, you have to have a case brought before oh, you. I mean, absolutely. I think absolutely. I think try to put that in context. Yeah. We're not giving you the license no, no, to no. start enacting law. You have to have a real case, right? <laughs> we, we, have, we have to have uh, what's called a justiciable case or a case of contra exactly. controversy before the court. And in layman's terms, all that means is 
Somebody's up, got to be up there whose ox is getting gored. <laughs> and if we have that, then the court can, uh, can do things. Things have to be raised in the district courts. They have to start there and, and be litigated there. Uh, they have to be raised, but, uh, but there is accountability. At least there's the Constitution. Ken tells me we've got five more minutes. Great. Great. Sure. Uh, and uh, a lot of what you said, I, I'm, I'm hearing. Um, there, this in this wonderful Declaration of Rights, and, and, and you know we haven't mentioned Dorothy Act either. Um, between Dorothy and Bob, they both parented this this wonderful set of words. But there, there, there are some that haven't fulfilled the promise, and I want to sort of talk about a couple of those and then ask what you think happened. Um, I remember reading Bob Campbell's uh, arguments on the floor of the convention with respect to Section 10, the right of privacy. And Bob speaks about the power of corporations to gather data about individuals. And this is 40 years ago, right? 1972. And I keep asking Bob, you know, will you show me where your time machine is hidden? Because, um, you know, we, today we can see it. Um, and Bob was arguing about the fact that the Section 10 applied not only to state action, but the actions of individuals and corporations. Um, and Wade Hood mentions the fact that, well, the Supreme Court has already addressed that. We really don't even express right of privacy. And that brings to mind a case that they decided in 1952, and I want to tell the story about it because it's interesting. A guy named Pritchard was a landlord, and a family named Welsh had rented a house from him. And Pritchard, I don't remember why, um, wanted to kick his tenants out of the house. And the Welshes, I don't remember why, didn't want to leave. And so Mr. Pritchard decided that the best way to get him out of the house was to move into their living room. <laughs> and that's what he did. So it ends up in court with the Welshes sue Mr. Pritchard for invading their right to privacy. They recover a judgment. It goes up to the Montana Supreme Court. The Montana Supreme Court says yes. They violated the right to privacy. Um, now, then the 72 Constitution is adopted. In 1985, the Montana Supreme Court gets a case in which a landlord is looking for something in the tenant's apartment and looks under the bed and sees some stolen property. I forget how he knew it was stolen. And of course he says, oh, call the police, tell them about it. Um, and in that case, State versus Long, the court holds, well, Section 10 does not apply to private actions, and therefore not to corporations and so on. That, that's one. The other one is Section 29, the section that restores full rights to people after they've paid their debt to society, to formal criminals. Um, that case says, that Section 29 says, full rights, full rights. Um, yet, when the question of what that meant came to the Montana Supreme Court, the Montana Supreme Court says, well, full rights doesn't mean everything. It means only civil rights. That is, those sorts of things that not come from uh, us, come to us from God, come to us at birth, but those sorts of things like the right to vote, um, the right to participate, that are created as a part of government. And therefore, um, things that we do to people, even after they've paid their debt to society, that, have, that in, uh, affect their ability to get a job, their ability to travel, that's not included. And so, even though the word full civil rights was not in there, um, nevertheless, that piece was narrow. So, and Bob can probably join in too. So what do you think happened well, between Section 10 and Section 29? Well, Section 10 is our right of privacy. We debated that on the floor. And we said the right of privacy applies only to an individual, not a corporation. So as a consequence, the right of privacy, of course, is a right that the individual enjoys in Montana. With respect to these other rights, 
I think they're all very clear that with respect to government, the citizen has the right to participate, has the right to know what's going on. When you have some question, some conflict, then it's up to our Supreme Court to decide just precisely how that comports with the guarantees of the Constitution. And I think there are numerous opinions from our Supreme Court in the last 40 years where they uphold those provisions that I think protect the individual. But are you, um, Justice Nelson, do you want to comment on one of the, I think in talking about the right of individuals being restored after they've completed their uh, supervision? Well, I, I, I think I have in mind at least one thing you're talking about, Jeff, and uh, I guess I can, I can comment on that since we've had several opinions on it. Uh, people who commit violent crimes or sexually based crimes in Montana, uh, if they're convicted or they plead guilty to those, uh, there are statutory uh, requirements that they register. They have to register with the sheriff every place they live. Uh, they have to advise the sheriff when they change, <coughs> change residences. Uh, they have to register uh, their name and where they're living and, and uh, so forth. And uh, that becomes public information. And uh, of course, uh, nobody likes to have a sex offender living next to them, so when they try to get accommodations or rent an apartment or so forth, uh, usually there's a community hullabaloo about this sex vendor not living in our, in our community. And, uh, nobody's going to hire these people. Uh, we've had cases, and I, I'm, I'm not making this up. Uh, they may be on probation, and the address that they list, and they have to list an address for probation purposes, the address they list is uh, that I'm living under the bridge on 54th Street or something. That, and that's, I'm not, I'm not making that up. So, sexual offender registration, even once you're relief, re released from supervision, uh, that requirement goes on. Uh, it's a lifetime requirement unless you can convince a court someplace uh, to say that you don't have to register. And, and it's very difficult to do that. Um, so, in other words, you, we have, up, as a state, we have upheld those laws under this constitutional provision. It's not being inconsistent with the constitutional provision of restoration of rights. We have, we have said that, yes. And uh, we have done it for different reasons, uh, rightly or wrongly, and I would <coughs> offer to Jeff probably believes wrongly. Uh, but we consider those for the sorts of requirements not to be punishment, although that's been argued that they are, that they are remedial in nature, they uh, make sure that uh, uh, <coughs> sex offenders who, who unfortunately are usually recidivist convert these crimes again. Uh, everybody knows where they are, but I, I assume that's maybe one of the things that Jack is talking about. But as a court, you're always balancing things. I mean, one of the big debates in the Constitutional Convention is that we knew that the right of privacy and the right to know would be at odds uh, many, many times. We knew it. And, and there was a part of an argument, well, should we put the right to know in because we no 